I worked close to 16 years non-union. Oh, okay. I didn't join the union until 2007. And I was living in PA. I had moved back in with mom and dad after I got out. My whole career of being interested in building started when I was little. Dad was a designer for an architectural firm. He didn't have his stamp, but he did all the drawings and detailed everything. And when I was six, we built my parents' house. So I learned how to use a handsaw and a hammer from a good friend who was a union carpenter at that time. And then through the 80s, after I got out of the Marines, up in PA and everything, the unions were still having trouble getting to work. So I would went to one of the subs for dad's company because when the principal passed away, he had left the architectural firm ah. and went to, at that time, it was a union contractor. Okay. But they ended up having to close the union side down and opened up as a non-union open shop. And then one of the sub interior subs, I went to work for them and was doing metal fr- stud framing, drywall, acoustical ceilings, all the exterior framing, so on and so forth. So, yeah, I've been around it for a lot longer than 30 years. Oh, I've been goodness. actually getting paid in the trade since 91. Oh, yeah. That is my friend, Mr. Clyde King, who happens to be like, only the second carpenter that we've had on the show, which didn't occur to me until I was like prepping for the show notes and got to do better with that. Anyhow, I was like ultra excited that Clyde accepted my request to interview him on the show for a couple of reasons. One, he's got a ton of experience. I mean, he's been in the industry for a very long time and he's tinkering around quite a bit with social media, technology, video, content creation. Uh, which which to me is just a special mix, especially, you know, the generation that he comes from. And in our conversation, we talk about that generation. Which generation? The boomer generation. Specifically the work ethic around there. He, he kind of helped me go back in time on a little memory I had about my dad working with them out there a long time ago. And, you know, those the, there's just a different depth of, grit, I think, with with some folks. And it seems to be that there's a concentration of that in the boomer generation. And like I said, because he comes from a time that some people now in the industry may not be aware of. And that time, there was a different type of tool. When I say different type of tools, I mean like an electric tool with a cord was a premium price and difficult to get your hands on. So you had hand-powered tools. And I only remember messing around with my dad's stuff. And so we got to talk about Clyde's collection back there. And of course, like that transition or his experience of working like his day-to-day was hand tools to now creating content and producing video and editing all the digitally type magically whiz-bangy stuff. it It was an awesome conversation. And yep, this is only half of the conversation. You're going to get the next half here in a few days. And before we go back to the future with Clyde King, I got a shout out for CRM Consultant. CRM Consultant left a a nice, awesome uh, review that made me smile on the inside and out on the Apple podcasting thing. And guess what? You can do the same. And it would make me smile just the same. So CRM Consultant says, Just listen to episode number three, loving the conversation about masculinity traits and normalizing treating people like a human. More topics like these are needed in the world. Thank you, CRM consultant. And that episode number three that is being referenced is the conversation that Thomas LeMay and I had on the goal. It was a collabo session on the goal. And like that whole series of conversations, we talk a lot about mental health, mental wellness, masculinity, and some of these things that uh, maybe don't provide the optimal conditions for us to thrive uh, long-term physically and mentally. So go check those out. I'll put a link in the comments for you. Um, And also there's a bunch of links in the comments. 
There's one ultra special link. It's an emotional bungee jumpers link. We got group two open up. First one is going to be happening on June 9th. Uh, and that group is going to be meeting the second Friday of every month at 2 p.m. Central. So check it out. Hit it up. And here we go to Mr. Clyde King. What's going on, l &M family? I'm here with fellow creator, construction professional extraordinaire, Mr. Clyde. How are you doing today, Mr. Clyde? We're doing good. It's been a long day at work, but we're doing good. <laughs> oh, so we were just talking about that behind the scenes. Long day at work. I think that for as construction professionals, that's a different meaning. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you've been over for six hours working on something that ain't waist high and it just tears your body apart, huh? Yes. Especially oh, being man. at 59. <laughs> oh, man. You know, there's something there. You're similar to my father's generation that just don't stop. No, you can't. <laughs> you got to keep going. Where does that come from, sir? I guess... It was the way I was brought up. Dad was a Marine as well. Okay. So it's instilled from, like, a, I'm the tail end of the baby boomers there. Yep. It's instilled into you. Yep. Believe me, there's times that I want to just say, you know what? It could wait a little more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember one time my dad and I were working together for the same outfit, and we had to hike cast iron pipe up the stairs because we got kicked out of the elevator, the emergency elevator that had like medical gas equipment yeah. and connections and stuff, because it was the only one that we could fit 10 foot joints in. And one of the runs we we're making up there, we dinged the wall and they said, okay, that's it. Y'all are out. Said, so now we had to carry them up the damn stairs, four floors worth of stairs. There was this one guy who was a little, I was 23, maybe the guy may have been in his, late twenties, early thirties. And he had just got his journeyman's license, his plumber license. And he said, I ain't carrying pipe up the stairs. I'm a journeyman. And my dad, master plumber, went and grabbed himself a joint of four inch pipe and another stick of two inch pipe, held that one kind of on the floor and on his shoulder and showed him his master's license. You're a journeyman. I'm a master. Put it on his shoulder and took him up the damn stairs. And I said, man, I was proud of my dad. I was impressed. And then I was like, damn it. Now I got to do the same thing. <laughs> yep. Oh, there just... was a couple jobs years ago, back probably 92. The boom truck mm. had screwed up and we were carrying drywall up around stairs. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, man. And they just, your body don't forget that for a couple no. of days, huh? <laughs> Mr. Clyde, what I understand so far is went to high school, joined the Marines. You were there for about eight years. And then you come out and join the Carpenter Apprenticeship Carpenter Union. Is that the timeline? No, actually, I worked close to 16 years non-union. Oh, okay. I didn't join the union until 2007. And I was living in PA. I had moved back in with mom and dad after I got out. My whole career of being interested in building started when I was little. Dad was a designer for an architectural firm. He didn't have his stamp, but he did all the drawings and detailed everything. And when I was six, we built my parents' house. So I learned how to use a handsaw and a hammer from a good friend who was a union carpenter at that time. And then through the 80s, after I got out of the Marines, up in PA and everything, the unions were still having trouble getting to work. So I would went to one of the subs for dad's company because when the principal passed away, he had left the architectural firm ah. and went to, at that time, it was a union contractor. Okay. But they ended up having to close the union side down and opened up as a non-union open shop. And then one of the sub interior subs, I went to work for them and was doing metal fr stud framing, drywall, acoustical ceilings, 
all the exterior framing, so on and so forth. So, yeah, I've been around it for a lot longer than 30 years. Oh, I've been goodness. actually getting paid in the trade since 91. Nice. So, you know, it's interesting. You say you got introduced to a hammer and a handsaw. Yes. And like that, you really mean a handsaw. Handsaw, yes. <laughs> not, not a circular not a power saw. saw. <laughs> a handsaw. <laughs> I'm laughing because I remember as a kid with my dad, he was primarily, I guess, for like when I was young, elementary, middle school, he spent most of his career working in like residential, multifamily type work. Yeah. It wasn't until later that I remember him getting into commercial construction. I remember the handsaw, the keyhole saw that we had to use to do different things. And that damn handsaw, man, whenever it would hang up, it would just, you had to get in a groove and let that thing just cut smooth. Yeah, you got to let the saw do the work. Yeah. I still got a couple. Do you? Do, oh, do you remember the drill that you oh, have yeah, in those? Mid race. Yes. <laughs> you got some? Yeah, I got one of them out there too. Oh man, those are the coolest. How about it was a ruler, like a folding ruler, wooden? Yep. Yeah. I carry one of them with me a lot. No way. Makes it nice for if and when it's a time like right now, I'm back in my tools working a small crew. Right. But a lot of times, if we'd be setting bolts on piers and that, we built, I run the robot. I was quality control officer for a couple of years on a few huge gas processing plants. Okay. I mean, we were building three at a time, and these things are close to 15,000 yards of concrete apiece. Yeah. But when we set the bolts, having the folding roller, you can get the projection of the bolt a lot easier to read than having to deal with a tape measure that keeps flopping around. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Wow. So, okay. So you started six years old, kind of family introduction to the trades. And then you decided, well, this is what I'm going to do, make a living as a carpenter. Yeah, yeah, I love designing. And I was taught that I had my own little drawing table right beside his in the house, drafting ah. table. So I still do a lot of my drawings. Like you can see my architect's rule. And oh, yeah. I've got all my squares and everything back here for sitting here doing designs for things that I built in the wood shop, I still do a lot of it by hand. I do have SketchUp and that on my laptop that I'll, but most of my designs that I do, I still do the old fashioned way by hand. Same way when I first learned how to estimate, I did it the old fashioned way with it, taking off the drawings with the roller, writing a notebook (laughs) and line item by line item by line item. (laughs) Oh yeah. So, In your career, you've been able to see, like, the evolution of technology. We're joking about the handsaw and the power saw, and now you got 24-volt cordless everything. How shocking was it as those technologies evolved within the industry? The one that really made the big impact on carpenters early was the little plumb bob laser. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Because... When I started with that interior company, they weren't out yet. Mm. We plumbed our top track up with a plumb bob with your thumb up against the ceiling going down to that pencil mark on the floor or the chalk line on the floor. Yeah, that laser. We did our exterior walls, too. There was times that we'd have a guy standing there if it was a little breezy. (laughs) We'd literally drop the plumb bob down through a piece of PVC pipe to keep the wind off the string. He'd be standing there holding that tube. And you're up. <laughs> Hold it steady. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. I've been there with the wind kicking that dang plumb bob off just enough to be off. And if it's off a little here, it can be a whole hell of a lot off down the line. Oh, yeah. When you're dealing with 14 foot floors normally in between the structure, you're up there with a 14 foot or a 20 ounce plumb bob hanging on your string on your thumb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. It gets a little old. <laughs> so yeah, the plumb laser that and then the rotating lasers and the technology, how they've changed and the green beams compared to the red beam laser. Yeah, that red beam's good when you don't have a ton of light. Right. If you got daylight coming in, it makes it very difficult to see that red well, beam. And 
the red beam lasers, they're maxed out on as far as what the capacity they're putting out. They can't go any higher now. Oh, really? They're, okay. they're at the max that they're allowed to be putting out. And if you've got a hundred foot room, by the time you get, when you aim that thing down at that wall, you're looking at a dot that's three quarters of an inch in diameter or better. Oh, so the, the accuracy is blown. Yep. And mm-hmm. the green beams, just little tiny dots still. Ten four, And I feel like, so as you were coming through, I'm sure you worked with a bunch of folks that maybe embraced technology and also a bunch of folks that didn't want to change. Oh, yeah. How'd you deal with that? It was a lot of companies back in throughout the 90s. A lot of them would still run corded screw guns, corded circular saws, and you're tripping over cords, you're doing this. And finally, they had no choice but to, it's like either jump ahead and jump on the bandwagon with the battery stuff, or you're going to get left behind. There's a safety element. I worked with the guy who he blew my mind because I didn't see it that way. I just liked cordless tools. I was reluctant with some cordless tools because it was like, don't be lazy. I I, I always did it with cord. I was pretty good at rolling up a cord. So it just depended on what the work was, right? Hammer drill. Yeah. Cordless band. So I don't know because it's a little cut slot. It's not big enough. Anyhow, a guy I worked with was like, Jess, if we just went cordless, our risk, like our safety will go up. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, because there's no cords for trip hazards. Yeah. And I said, oh, I didn't think of it that way. There was a lot of times on jobs that we had to make cord trees. Uh, (laughs) When the cords get them up off the floor. Yeah. And that could be a pain in the butt too. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Yes, totally, totally. There's a ton of benefit to the evolution of technology it's just the adoption rate is different for, I think, a bunch of us. What's really interesting to me is knowing that you've spent a good chunk of your years on this world with your hands on an actual handsaw. And then fast forward to today where you're posting regularly on LinkedIn and posting videos and editing stuff and drones. And where did your appetite for embracing new technologies come from, Mr. Clyde? Like I said, I love to design and build. That's the reason I went into the carpenters where I'm using my hands is, yes, I love to design, but I can't sit behind a desk all day. (laughs) (laughs) It drives me nuts. I'm too used to being hands on. So I started embracing some of the technology. My little brother actually got me into with AutoCAD and that. He's a mechanical engineer. Ah. He went to WVU and graduated in 95 and now has his own powder coating business up in PA. But he went to mechanical engineering route so we could design our race car chassis. We've designed and built our own racing go-kart frames that we ran for years. Then what they call a micro sprint, which now a lot of the micro sprints are like 600 cc street bike motors on them. Back when we ran them, they were 250cc dirt bike two strokes. So, where you can get the weight and everything else. And he started bringing me into the technology on that design aspect as far as the chassis. And then I just went and ran with it. I got into the camera, the video. I've got, I think, six GoPros that we stick on both the race cars at different times. <laughs> I was working with a team here in Buchanan after I moved down here in Mm. 2006. And uh, two years ago, my brother decided to come out of retirement and get back into it up there. Now we're going to try to run two cars. Last year, we didn't get either one. He ran about six races and got clobbered. And he was so busy at the shop, we just never got his car back out. And we never had mine finished because we're waiting on parts and money for motor dirt late models get quite expensive if we're both running what they call a crate late okay. which is a, a sealed gm motor we can't do anything to the motors they're all the same horsepower roughly and then it's all gets into chassis and shocks and so i started embracing learning about the technology there i could sit there and design how the front end geometry comes up to 
weight transfer. So you got into the racing and the designing piece. That's a common thread is what I'm hearing so far. Yeah. Designing by hand and you learn how to do some of the stuff on the computery fancy stuff. Video because of the racing. Video editing. Yeah, just I was watching different things about attracting sponsors and that for the race car. And that's when I got into a little bit of that more to say, okay, we can showcase you this way. And now with LinkedIn, just hope I could do the same type thing and promote my personal brand and also pass my knowledge on. Oh, that Clyde, that is like the inspiring thing is you're on what? 212, 213 days yeah, now? 215 will post Friday. Okay. So 215 is Friday. So it's 215 consecutive days that you've been posting about. For probably the first hundred, it was daily, daily, even Saturday and Sunday. Okay. And then somewhere in the 150 range, I went to just, let's go Monday through Friday. Okay. So work days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the purpose is for you to share your knowledge. I mean, that's yep. what I'm taking away from you. You're sharing your yep. knowledge so that other people can have access to that. Yep. What was it like when you first started doing that? It was interesting. The first ones were literally random. I would pull into the job site, sitting in the car, pull up my phone and just start typing. Okay. It's whatever hit my head that morning or something we might have been dealing with on that job and then now i've got in to where i can schedule them now that linkedin has the scheduling thing so i can do a week's worth ah. over the weekend with canva and that and then yeah. schedule them for that following week was it uncomfortable for you when you first started in terms of what you were going to put out there and how people were going to respond yeah to a point like i said the first ones were literally just random thought and then maybe a picture or so off the phone from the job site or how things were going. But now I'm at that age. It's if we don't get these younger people involved and pass our knowledge on the trades are in trouble. So with my 30 plus years and from project management to superintendent to general foreman, to foreman, the worker, it's okay. Let's, take little bits and let's pass this knowledge on. Oh man. Amen is what I got to say to that. <laughs> There's a lot of knowledge out there and I'm sure you've worked with folks, come across some folks in your years that hoard the knowledge and hoard the, oh, yeah. they're afraid to teach the next generation because they're afraid of losing their job. I want to say the last 10 years that I was out there playing in the wild, I didn't see a whole bunch of that, but Early, like in 95, I'll say 95 to 02, man, it felt every project I was on, there was a, at least a few plumbers that were hoarding that information and didn't want to pass on any knowledge. It was the same with the carpenters. Was it really? Yeah. Okay. It's not just a plumber thing. No, it's across all the trades. Ah, okay. So have you seen it get better over the years? Yeah, it has definitely changed. But you still got some old school pains in the ass that they'll tell you the basic way to do it, but they won't show you the little tricks that they've developed. They make it better for them and yeah. for everybody around them. They keep those in their back pocket. Yeah, that's still happening. Yeah, <laughs> I probably do the same thing with content. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there's different little things I showed the apprentice. This poor kid, he is a new apprentice. Okay. He had been working in the trades a little bit with an non-union company yep. and came down. And I happened to, the day I met the gentleman with the company I'm with right now, like I said, they're a non-union company, but we're in there. They signed a project agreement to have us do all their form work and then whatever else they need yep. done. So we're doing a little bit of everything. But th that day, I happened to go down to our hall to talk with our business agent or organizer to make sure all the paperwork was ready for when they said we can get up to the airport that we were going. He wasn't there, but they happened to be doing an orientation test for mm -hmm. a bunch of new apprentices. So I sat in to help the instructors, just talking yeah. to them, watching their work. 
this kid aced everything. He's going to be a real good apprentice. After he's done with his four years, he's going to make a hell of a journeyman. Nice. So you seen him and you scooped him up, huh? You said, hey. You need to well, yeah, I kind of lucked into him. <laughs> he was going to give his company a couple week notice when they called him. And he was looking to get a couple week notice on when he could start. Rep called him and he happened to talk him into starting that next day. Oh, man, right when it was getting juicy. If you've ever been on the hunt for getting a good, an apprentice with like solid skills that you want to pour into, you know the excitement that Clyde was feeling what he, in what he was just telling us. Uh, so that's the end of the first part. The next part two is going to be coming out real quickly because I slacked off last week. Anyhow, you can get, check it out here in a few days. And while you're waiting for part two to come out, there's a whole library of episodes that you can go out there and consume and comment and leave reviews about. And also, I just uh, made a little tweak to m the Learnings and Missteps blog. And that tweak is specifically giving some behind-the-scenes detail, uh, maybe some facts and, and thoughts that I left out of the book becoming the promise you are intended to be. That book is going to be hitting June 23rd, uh, but every week now I'm going to be releasing just a little, you know, some behind the scenes stuff, kind of what I was thinking, what I'm uncomfortable about and, and give people a little more insight as to the purpose of it and, and where it's coming from. Go to depthbuilder.com forward slash blog, and there's a whole bunch of entries in there. I'd love to get your feedback. There's actually like a little sign up thing. If you want to get like a sneak peek of the audio version of the book, I have some clips available in exchange for your email address. You'll get uh, the audio version of me reading the dedication and the foreword written by my friend Lee Crump, who's the dude who like inspired me to write the darn book. So that's enough of me talking. Appreciate your time and we'll see you soon. My goodness, you're either driving down the road or just so enthralled with the, with this whole podcast that you went all the way down to the very, 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 very end of it. And we appreciate you. And just we're going to take this as an indication of your dedication. So we got a little special request of you, a call to action, because everybody tells us that like you need to have a call to action. So here's the call to action. Be kind to yourself. Go out there and share a smile with someone.